Dear guests and participants, hello and welcome at the conference. New strategy on the deposit guarantee funds. It's going to be an expert discussion of the financial issues and we're going to address outlooks for the deposit guarantee fund. We will see where it's at right now and we'll also speak about the future of the fund, the mission, the strategy of this important financial organization. Back in 2014, there was a crisis across the banking system. The deposit guarantee fund played a crucial part back then. The idea was to help the banking system survive and it would make everybody sure that the Ukrainian banking system is a strong foundation which would not let this country face this problem. We know that the fund has been able to do the job. We remember there have been issues faced by the banks which had to be taken out of the market. So it's not just a finance stock. In each bank you get thousands of people which had deposits and savings there, their pension accounts. Most of the Ukraine folk can be sure about their tomorrow in terms of their financial standing. They keep in touch with the banking system and that's the major role of the deposit guarantee fund. So that's where it's at today, but which way are things going to be going tomorrow and what should the fund be doing for the sake of the banking system? So we're going to do this international expert discussion to try and learn more about that. We have about 200 participants that signed up for this talk in order to follow the proceedings here. There will be two languages going here in chat and Zoom. You can choose the language you're comfortable with. We have Ukrainian and English going here. Should you experience any technical issues, you're welcome to chat with the admin in Zoom. But I think you're not going to experience major problems. You're welcome to put questions to all, part to all of the participants here. We're going to have an official opening, then we're going to be exposed to the presentation from the chair of the fund and we'll see which way the fund is going, what are the key missions, objectives of it. Then we will discuss what we have heard and we will think of the outlooks for the fund and things that it's supposed to do. And then we're going to be able to collect the questions that are going to be emerging through the chat in the course of the proceedings. So right now you can think of your questions, put them in the chat, and we're going to have about 30 minutes, if all goes as planned, to furnish answers to those questions. So with this I'd like to start an opening round. Svetlana Rekord the director and administrator of the fund. Hello everybody, all of the participants, viewers and stakeholders. I'm happy to welcome you at this international conference. In today's realities we're doing this in a slightly unusual format. It's an online format. That's where it's at today and we're going to discuss that. All in all, I'd like to wish everybody success and interest and experience watching this conference and new knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. And with this, we can have it from the chair of the NBU, Mr. Shevchenko. Dear Svetlana and all of the staff of the Deposit Guarantee Fund, I'm happy opening this conference, which is going to be an expert talk on strengthening financial sector, 
The fund will always be an important part of the financial stability in the country and a reliable partner for banks. Jointly, we have been able to make progress. The Parliament has made changes to the legislation which enhances the powers of the fund protect and interests of citizens. In the first reading, the MPs have passed a draft on stability of the system of deposit guarantee. So, up to 600,000 grivna worth of recompense will be there. Non-banking financial institutions are now supervised by the NBU. The next step is building the system of guaranteeing funds from the population that go through the non-financial institutions. I think our efficient cooperation will go on for the sake of stability and progress in the banking system. It's going to be good for the financial standing of everybody in Ukraine. Thank you everybody who contribute to the success of the fund. Dear friends and colleagues, I wish you to have a fruitful discussion here. There are big time objectives we are pursuing and I think we're going to be able to handle all of that successfully. I wish you all peace and safety here. Thank you so much for this opening address and with this We're going to get it from Danila Yetmansev, the MP, the Chair of the Committee on Finance, Taxation and Customs Policy. Can you hear or see us? Hello. We can have it from you right now. Mr. Hetmans of the MP, the Chair of the Committee on Finance, Tax and Customs Policy, so he's going to get in touch with us. It's not happening right now, so we haven't heard all of the opening remarks, and with this I'd like to turn over to Mr. Robert Bond, who runs the USAID project, Transformation of the Financial Sector. USAID is a long-standing partner of the fund, and they offer its support, which makes this event possible. Okay, we've got Mr. Hetmansev with us online right now. Okay, connection established, so let's have it from you first. Sorry, there have been issues with the connection here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak at this important international conference, which addresses an important thing for the fund itself as an institution. Also, it's important for the development of the entire banking sector and financial services in the country. Stability of banking system, its development and public trust that it should enjoy is something that is a number one thing for the deposit guarantee fund. The fund is supposed to protect the deposits from citizens and it should be involved in the procedure of liquidating the insolvent banks and that performance of the fund will be crucial to the development of the banking market. We will see if deposits are going to be going up or not. We will see if the fund will receive more public trust from citizens or not. We also have to consider the role of the fund in terms of stability of the non-banking financial sector, and that's also an important thing. I believe that the insurance companies and credit unions and other operators and the regulator, all of them should take care of the interests of their I investors just as the interests of banks. We had some time to review the legislative needs in the system of guaranteeing 
deposits and the Supreme Council in May of 2020 made changes to some of the existing laws improving the regulation of banking operations. It was hard to pass that law. The whole country could see how it was going. There was a lot of resistance, but they made it. And right now it is safe to say that there have been some results of that. On the 30th of June of this year, we passed one more draft law, which is supposed to make changes to some existing laws. It's about meeting the needs of lenders of those banks. And that one determines, actually improves, the regulation of relations when it comes to liquidating banks. It offers better opportunities for the fund when the property gets sold. And also it allows the fund to operate as a part of the criminal proceedings in court trials and in the payment of court fees. So that should become a prerequisite for further progress of the deposit guarantee fund. And the third draft law we voted on in the first reading, 5542-1, it's the draft that makes a shut bank a system of deposit guarantee. And it also addresses a number of things related to this country, there was a time when banks were folding for the most part. So we need to stabilize the financial status of the guarantee fund and we need to improve the status at the expense of the national government. I think this draft will do its job and also it will increase the amount for the guarantee of deposits, 600,000. That's what people were asking for and there is a growing demand for deposits and we need to make a step towards people to keep this thing happening. So it's important to adopt the draft. So we're ready for the second reading and somewhere this coming October we're going to vote on that finally. We keep working with the Deposit Guarantee Fund all the time. Uh, we are constructive as a Finance Committee, as a Supreme Council, and the DGF works with us as well. There is a lot of reciprocity there. It's not like we would think of one thing while making laws and the DGF would not accept it. No, we are totally in sync with them and we would always find a trade-off with them. I guess that's the way to go and that's a showcase of how a legislative branch is supposed to work, the national bank, government authorities and public at large. So I think we're going to keep working along these lines and this will pay off. So thank you and I wish you proceedings, uh, I wish you success in the course of the proceedings here. Thank you, Danilo. Thank you for your kind words and active collaboration with the DGF. Thank you so much. And with this, let's have one more set of opening remarks from Robert Bond, who runs the UCD project, Transformation of Financial Sector. Let's have it from him. that I cannot be with you in person uh, here today for this important conference. USAID's relationship to the Deposit Guarantee Fund is deep and long-lasting. Personally, I can remember working uh, with Andrea Lanechek and the DGF and the World Bank over 10 years ago on the law that created the modern uh, DGF. That law transformed the Deposit Guarantee Fund from a simple pay box into a, an institution that deals with bank resolution and liquidation. Following the passage of that law, USAID supported the Deposit Guarantee Fund, uh, as did the U.S. Uh, Treasury, in, uh, with technical assistance and training uh, to make it the institution it is today. During the last financial crisis, the DGF played a pivotal role in supporting the financial system and assuring stability here in Ukraine. Uh, by communicating effectively with the public, 
uh, about the deposit guarantee system, uh, about the procedures required to safeguard your money, and with assurances that that money it was still protected, the DGF provided essential stability to the system. At a time when over 100 Ukrainian banks failed, that was absolutely critical. Over the past five years, uh, my project, the USAID Financial Sector Transformation Project, has focused in part on increasing public confidence and trust in the financial system. As you all know, trust is the most important element in uh, financial system stability. The DGF has worked as a committed partner in our activities in financial literacy, in our activities in financial education, conducting surveys and public opinion polls, organizing conferences and seminars, and a whole host of other activities to explain what the DGF is and what it does. Since our project only has three or four more months before it ends, I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank the DGF for being such a professional and helpful collaborator in our efforts in the area of uh, public confidence building in Ukraine. I want you to know that uh, USAID values its collaboration with the DGF uh, and that there will be a follow-on project in the financial sector and that I can assure you the DGF will figure prominently in the work that USAID continues to do. Thank you, USAID, for the opportunity to have this discussion going here so we can discuss where it's at today and where it's going to be in the future. The fund keeps on changing within its concept and also there have been visual changes. Right now we can see qualitative changes in the branding of the fund, in the identity of the fund, and we're going to get more on that from the next presenter. So with this we're going to present a new brand, a new image of the Deposit Guarantee Fund. There is Bicentric Marketing Agency Ksenia Shuinska and there is Nahim Chak. They will tell us what has actually changed and what was the reason behind it. But let's look at a short video before that. Hello everybody, on behalf of Bicentric, I'd like to welcome everybody in here. We appreciate the opportunity to tell you a bit more about what's new in the brand and positioning of the DGF. We're going to brief you on the key things that have been done jointly with the DGF. So what's new in the brand? It's not just a new logo type. We determined the positioning of the DGF for the rest of the world, the communication, the role of the fund for the sake of the well-being of each Ukrainian and stability of the financial system in the country. It's been a special endeavor. Typically, while rebranding any company or an agency, the brand is shaped up by the company's strategies, it's based on the company's future. Then they think of internal processes, communication with the clients and stakeholders. They transform it all in terms of the newly determined positioning. In the case of the DGF, everything was different. The internal transformations have been complete and tested. Effectively, we helped our colleagues and partners we helped them update the new contents of the brand. We helped 
it gain new positioning and identity. And while doing that, we could see that we had to look into the perception of the DGF brand across many target audiences. Executive Directorate of the fund, the uh, chairs of its units, partners in the financial systems, NBU, Minister of Finance, Supreme Council committees. Uh, surprisingly, we could see that the strategic vision of the DGF positioning matched opinions across the groups, and it was pretty much identical. And this strongly suggests that the new positioning is fair and it's adequate to where things are right now. The new brand is in line with the reality and it's a real deal. It's not something that was created artificially. So let's see what this brand is like right now. It has become more friendly, better understandable to the users of financial services. We abandoned a complicated acronym which used to be there before, FGVFO. Uh, it was repelling to users, they would never get the point. Now the DGF is called the way it is, Deposit Guarantee Fund. It's as clear as you can get. The visual transformation has happened too. So we actually transformed the key idea of the font, which is protection. Previously, the logo carried some arms or hands, which were supposed to be protecting you. They would protect people's money. We transformed it into a figure, which is something simple and understandable. It looks like a lozenge, and inside that lozenge, you get a white sector, which communicates the role of the DGF to the financial system. So it's in the core of all partners of the financial sector and it's in the middle of the financial stability of the country. And lastly, it is something important to all of us, deposit guarantee, preventing bank bankruptcy, financial stability, all of that allows this country to be calm and certain. Sometimes we're concerned about certain bad things happen, like what if a bank goes bust, what if something else goes wrong. So the certainty is pretty much a part of the new brand of the fund and it can be seen visually. So speaking of all of those what ifs, so let's run the image video of the fund first. We all would like to be certain about ourselves, the country we live in, the future we have. Uncertainty comes from doubts, like you get lots of what-ifs. We want to see what's going to be happening to us and our savings, no matter what. The savings have to be protected, so we're going to be sure. We're going to be living here, making plans, raising kids. We're going to be free and reliant, because freedom is responsibility for the future together with the DGF, we're going to be making progress, changes. It all will happen together with us, with the society, with the state. DGF is the key part of the financial security system, our financial security for investors, lenders, banks, investors, state. Freedom equals responsibility, responsibility equals guarantees. deposit guarantee fund, our guarantee, your financial certainty. So the fund and it's tomorrow, it's changing visually and concept-wise, so we're going to learn more about that right now from the managing director of the fund, Svetlana Rekrut, but let me tell you that following her talk, there's going to be an expert discussion and you're welcome to put your questions about what you have heard. Svetlana prepared the presentation and you can download download this in Ukrainian and English. You can do this straight from the chat box. So with this, Svetlana, you're welcome. Thank you. Dear friends and colleagues, today we're here to talk about transformation of contents and form. The new brand 
suggests that the fund that the fund keeps evolving. It reflects a new philosophy of the fund and our values. Our mission is to guarantee deposits to protect the rights of lenders. It is also about improving financial awareness so that there is going to be more public trust in the financial system and it's, it should help improve the well-being of society. The vision is about being open, innovative and reliable kind of partner which can prevent financial losses from happening and it will make with the global standards in the deposit guarantee field. Our values, proficiency, reliability, openness, integrity, security, patriotism, responsibility, innovativeness, partnership, stability and expert knowledge. We'll know that everything new is built on a certain foundation which was made in previous years. In previous years we have been able to make strong foundations. We'll know about the crisis of 2014 through 16. About 90 banks were taken out of the market. The fund paid 90 billion to 2 million investors. In order to do that important thing, which was so important to society, the fund had borrowed some funds, which was 80 billion grivna, which is about 2.5 billion euro. And we took it at market interest. So the fund has paid all back to NBU, so they paid back 25 billion grivna, 4.5 out of that is interest accrued. The Ministry of Finance received about 20 billion grivna, 7 billion out of that is also interest accrued. Because of that we reduced the basis for a calculation for accrual and right now the fund has debts which is 47 billion in the principal and 64 billion grivna in interest accrued. We also know that following the crisis the fund received a great deal of assets to manage. The total of them was more than 500 billion grivna. In order to pay back to the lenders we had to do a lot. We had to set up a transparent system of selling assets and asset management. And that's why the online pr platform was called Prezoro. Right now the platform has been around for three years and it has proven its efficiency and it has done all it takes 100%. The DGF has been able to transparently sell assets and to set up the bad loan market which has been the largest over the last five years in the Western Europe. It's been an uphill task, but we managed it, and uh, right now it's gratifying that we can leave something good for the generations to come. Since the DGF had too many assets to manage, they needed to offer services, so we created an automated system of payments, which is unique. and. Luckily, we can share our practices and experiences with the countries in need of such solutions as well. Let me tell you more about the system of automated payments. Any citizen can come to any office of the agent bank and receive the guaranteed amount without strings attached. So, it takes to have a passport and a code. The DGF has abandoned a typical format of inspections of participating banks. Because of the COVID, almost all of the bank inspections that work with the fund are done distantly online. Renting the property of insolvent banks is also addressed online. 
financial investments, investments in IT and intellectual investments paid off over the COVID crisis period. I'm happy to say that after the crisis began, the fund within a week has been able to fully switch to online operations without stopping any services. We would keep selling assets, would keep paying money to the investors, would keep working with the banks, we didn't lose a single grivna, all because in previous years we had been looking for online solutions for the sake of transparency and accessibility. But there is a need to move on. The DGF has coped with the changes and now we can admit that the fund is a partner for banks. What's the starting point for all of these transformations? Well, certain legislative changes, as Mr. Hetmans have suggested, and I'd like to go back to this point too. These changes are just the beginning, but we know what's the way forward. In the first reading they passed an important thing for the fund and the banking system and society at large. I'm speaking of the draft law on increasing the guarantee fund, restructuring the fund debt and making OSHA Bank a part of the guarantee system. The draft envisions that once it has been signed by Ukraine president and once it has been voted on in the second reading, the amount of guarantee will be doubled. It's going to be 400,000 grivna. It's about 13,000 euro. Starting the 1st of January of 2023, it's going to be troubled. It's going to be 600,000, and that's about 20,000 euro. Ever since the fund has been created, the amount guaranteed was 500 grivna back in 1998. Up to now, it would be increased 11 fold. But in European countries, this amount is 100,000 euro, and that's something we need to strive to move towards. That's our goal. Uh, we need to try and get closer to. There has been a gradual increase in the guarantee amount, and it should help us reach the global standards. It's about covering about 60% of the total of deposits. So if the amount guaranteed becomes 600,000, which is supposed to happen on a particular date, we're going to be able to cover more than 60% of the size of investments, deposits. This draft is also about restructuring the fund's debt vis-a-vis -vis the Ministry of Finance. And that's an important point, because a strong fund is a prerequisite for the stability of the banking system, and it's a good thing for every citizen. The debt restructuring envisions that the principal of the loan will be paid back to the Ministry of Finance at the expense of contributions from the participating banks. The interest accrued will be tied to the revenues from tied persons, affiliated persons, and um, the DGF in this regard will seek to make sure that affiliated persons become responsible, because responsibility is something that makes for stability and reliability tomorrow. The DGF works along three lines, criminal proceedings inside the country, court trials in the country, and court trials, criminal trials in foreign jurisdictions. The fund has 17 billion grivna worth of claims in criminal jurisdiction, 98 billion grivna in civil proceedings, and 49 billion grivna in foreign jurisdictions. We all can see that these are tremendous amounts, and all of that will replenish the national budget of the country. So it's a super important task the fund will be grappling with over years to come. We gained support from political willingness earlier this year. They established a group chaired by the Prime Minister, which is supposed to regain the assets of bankrupt banks, and hopefully what we pay to the Minister of Finance 
will keep on happening at the expense of what we get from affiliated persons, and this thing should become possible pretty soon. And there is one more thing about this draft. The Oshet Bank is becoming a part of the deposit guarantee system, so effectively it means that the banking market is there, it's uniform, it's competitive, and everybody plays by the same rules. This becomes a strong foundation for the banking system in this country, making it open to investors, also foreign investors. And hopefully, pretty soon, we will see these transformations happening. Thinking of the outlook like three to five years down the road, one of the top priorities of the fund is to provide European standards and achieve integration with the European directives. It goes in sync with one more objective, which is to make the guarantee cover non-banking financial institutions. There was a split and now non-banking financial institutions have to become full-blown players in the financial market. And for that to happen, you need to have a guarantee from the DGF. Right now we're talking credi credit unions, which account for 1.4 billion grivna, 19,000 investors. The next step we're going to work on with the market and the NBU is to cover life insurance companies. I mentioned European directives. In order to avoid the next crisis, you have to keep the public up to date, aware. I am speaking of financial knowledge, so we need to increase financial literacy of the population. And that's one of the priorities we have for the next three years. And I'm happy to say that there is a strong team of partners in the fund which help make this a real deal. I'm speaking of Ukrainian universities, teachers, instructors, and youth. So, ladies and gentlemen, and dear guests, I can tell you that our guarantee is your financial certainty. So I can assure you that the DGF is a strong, it's financially viable, it's ready to keep moving on. We're opening a new stage, so we are a partner of the banking sector. We're one of the guarantees of the financial stability of this country. It allows for the rapid response to happen in case there is a problem bank. Also, gently with the NBU, uh, we pursue a strategy which is in line with the requirements of European directives. I it increases financial awareness of citizens. And in conclusion, I'd like to thank and commend everybody, all of the partners of ours. And before we move on to the panel discussion, I'd like to say that DGF has a particular motto, a particular slogan, our guarantee your financial certainty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. You see which way the fund is going, and uh, it's good to have this discussion going, so the discussion is coming right up, it's going to feature quite some experts. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that you can start putting questions to any of the panelists. You can do this through the Zoom platform. So, think of your questions, have them coming in. We're going to be able to see them and share them with the panelists. But just before this discussion, I'd like for all of us to watch a few short videos which have been made with the help of the USAID, a long-standing partner of the fund. They feature the best 
experts in this country that have been able to go places and uh, they tell us that we can be certain about our tomorrow because there is DGF that does its part of the job so let's watch the videos each of the folks you're gonna see there have done well in their field and their opinion matters to many of us it's gonna help us make particular decisions it's a series of social videos and we want to popularize this thing we want for this information to circulate so let's see what these celebrities say now you know that your money is guaranteed and protected by the DGF in banks. What is success to me? It's my independence, financial independence. I'm certain about my savings. In the bank they are protected by the fund. Ask your bank which deposits are guaranteed and what's the guaranteed amount our guarantee your financial certainty now I know my money is in the bank protected by the DGF it's the 21st century you still keep your money in the bank it's better than having the cash in my pocket it's the little amount but it's in the bank it is protected by the DGF my pension and my grandson's fellowship is safe maybe you don't know but when the money is in the bank it is protected by the DGF. Our guarantee your financial certainty. Now you know everything. Your money is in the bank protected by the DGF. Keeping money in the bank is good. Deposits, salaries, all protected by the DGF. How can I check on that? Just check with the bank to see which deposits are guaranteed and what's the guaranteed amount. So these messages allow us to be certain about our tomorrow because the DGF is on it. So let's now start the panel discussion and um, let's go back to the priorities the fund will be working on and let me introduce the panelists and uh, all of the participants are welcome to put their questions to them through the Zoom platform and towards the end of this discussion we're going to be able to see what the questions are so Artur Adomski, director of the office the DGF of Poland also we're happy to welcome the financial director of the DGF Olena Nizhnenko deputy chair of the NBU Yaroslav Matusko Executive Director of Independent Banking Association Elena Korobkova, Deputy Director of the Managing Director of the DGF Mr. Viktor Novikov, Board Chair of Washington Bank Sergei Naumov, Board Chair of the Credit Union Vigoda Yuri Makritsky. This discussion will be moderated by the one who represents KPMG Ukraine, Yuri Fedorov, and I'd like to turn over to Yuri. Hello and welcome everybody. I'd like to thank Svetlana for this interesting talk. And thanks to all of the panelists. Hopefully it's going to be an interesting session today. 
we can see people from the DGF and from the regulator, from the banking, non-banking communities. Svetlana told us that the fund experienced a lot of transformations in its history. A lot has been done, so this time we're going to speak about existing challenges and the plans of the fund, so we need to see what exactly the fund is intending to do further. This time I'd like to start with European directives, because that's a key thing to the fund. So I'd like to speak with Artur and I'd like to ask him a question. So Ukraine is trying to implement European directives, but in Poland they started doing that earlier. So I'd like for Arthur to tell us about the Polish experience of implementing European directives, the experience of Poland, what were the key challenges, and how did the Polish deposit guarantee system address those challenges? What were the solutions, what were the lessons learned? And I think Arthur will tell us more about that. So, Arthur, could you hear us? Can you hear me? Чудно. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, uh, I would like to first uh, uh, say the correct uh, warmest break from uh, Warsaw. Uh, I would like to say it's a privilege for us to be part of the event. And uh, also, I would like to congratulate uh, our Ukrainian colleagues, partners in business, uh, Deposit Guarantee Fund of Ukraine, for the invitation for this respectful conference. Uh, this is very important. Uh, we support each other. We cooperate with each other for uh, many, many years. Uh, that is why uh, it is a uh, very uh, good opportunity for us to share our experience with the implementation of the uh, European directives into our national leg legislation. And uh, as far as we all remember uh, crisis of 2008, uh, we uh, remember the lessons that we learned from, uh, from this uh, crisis. Uh, when a lot of, of uh, citizen taxpayer money were uh, uh, used to uh, protect and to uh, uh, not to bankrupt uh, financial institutions. The most uh, important thing and the lesson learned from that time was uh, that uh, uh, the tax money payer should be involved at the last resort of uh, uh, protecting the financial institution. The owners of the financial institutions have to take the responsibility for their actions. And it, it was the origin of the all the legislation in European Union uh, launching the uh, uh, review of the uh, deposit guarantee uh, system directive and also banking recovery and resolution directive, the new directive that addressed this issue uh, that was learned from the uh, last crisis. And of course, uh, like in many countries, uh, adopting a new regulation is a challenge. And it's a challenge for the, uh, the institution that is uh, obliged to perform its new role, uh, but also for the safety net regulators, as well as the banking sector. Uh, in the case of Poland, uh, we as an institution, we uh, were the uh, institution that only uh, safeguard and ensure the deposit, uh, de deposits. And uh, we were attached to the new role, uh, which was the role of the uh, resolution authority. It was completely new ro role and with the completely new power. And uh, we need, as an institution, uh, face this challenge. And uh, in case of the institutional development, I need to say that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, adequate resources. This is what uh, I can uh, say as a, one of the most important. And I mean human resources and the financial resources. Also, uh, uh, the uh, Bank Guarantee Fund of Poland uh, uh, have to uh, um, safeguard 
the uh, liquidity in case of the uh, bank's failure. Uh, that is why we need to conclude some memorandum of understanding with the safety net players. Uh, another issue very important for the uh, 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 for us uh, was the development of the IT infrastructure that allow us to uh, prepare the bank warranty fund uh, to a new uh, task that uh, banking resolution and recovery directive uh, impose on on the Polish banking warranty fund. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to have adequate data on uh, banks and also uh, we have to uh, uh, have the system uh, that uh, were enable us to uh, prepare for the evaluation of the potential uh, resolvable uh, institutions. Uh, additionally, uh, we need to develop the new system of the uh, funding of the resolution. Uh, we have to uh, overview and uh, develop the new uh, framework for the uh, uh, contributions that are uh, paid by banks to the DGF. Uh, uh, we uh, launched the new methodology with was uh, risk-based a contribution system, and it also takes us a, a, a few years to develop. Of course, we were prepared to this a little bit earlier. Then, uh, the, the, and this is some kind of uh, highlights of the institutional challenges that we faced during this period of the implementation of the directive, resolution directive. Uh, additional challenge, uh, in my opinion, is uh, uh, cooperation and uh, communication with the safety players. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we need to uh, bear in mind that uh, for the financial stability of the country is responsible several institutions, including the central bank, including the uh, banking supervision, financial supervision, which is separate institution in Poland, and also uh, government, the Minister of Finance. Uh, safety net play a crucial role in the resolution processes. And uh, uh, one of the most important thing that we learned from the implementation period was uh, to find out uh, the way of the communication with the other uh, safety uh, net players. Uh, that is why we conclude the memorandum of understanding with the central bank uh, uh, for providing us uh, in the uh, liquidity uh, in case of uh, uh, preparing the resolution uh, for for the uh, entities and also uh, exchanging the information with our uh, supervisor uh, institution. Uh, I think that uh, one of the uh, things that we spent the most discussion was uh, to find out what is the exactly stage when the uh, regulator, banking supervisor, stop its action and when we step in as a resolution authority. Uh, this uh, this is a very delicate issue and a very important issue uh, because uh, uh, supervisor uh, uh, needs to... Uh, uh, discuss with us and we also need to discuss with the supervisor what is the best moment uh, to take the uh, responsibility for the resolution process with the bank uh, that is still uh, capable uh, to uh, act uh, uh, independently but uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, any kind of uh, um, possibility that the bank will recover. Uh, so uh, we precisely uh, uh, define uh, this stage with our uh, supervisory colleagues and uh, because uh, you need to understand that this borderline is uh, very important. Sometimes uh, if the supervisor uh, is too late with the uh, action or information to us, uh, the bank cannot be only bankrupt and there is no room for the resolution itself. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a very important part of the implementation of the resolution directive to uh, agree upon uh, the action 
between uh, those institutions, the central bank, uh, 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 Polish Financial Supervisory Authority and Bank Guarantee Fund. We reach our, uh, our uh, common understanding uh, where is the, the, the best time, where is the best stage when the supervisor de has decided that uh, the recovery or early intervention does not work and that there is a, a time for to step in with the resolution tools by uh, Bank Guarantee Fund. And last but not least, uh, I would like to mention that uh, the implementation of the directive was also uh, the very, uh, very important issue and challenge for the uh, banking industry, for our banks, our credit unions, uh, that needs to face the requirements that uh, directive imposed on this institution. And uh, the main, uh, the main uh, things that I uh, see from the uh, implementation period was uh, on the one hand, uh, there was development of the uh, reporting system that uh, allowed the uh, Bank Guarantee Fund as a resolution authority uh, to prepare uh, adequate data for the evaluation uh, purposes uh, of the institution. And the second, uh, uh, even more important, is uh, to safeguard the uh, EMREL in the institution. Uh, EMREL, I mean minimum requirement for the own funds and eligible liabilities, which is uh, uh, especially additional buffer of the capital that allows uh, to uh, resolution authority to conduct uh, efficiently uh, resolution. Uh, so, uh, to be in brief, I would say this is the main highlights uh, from the implementation period. And uh, I would say that, uh, that uh, 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 when the, uh, we implement into the, uh, our Polish legislation, uh, Banking Recovery and Resolution Directive, uh, it takes almost three years to uh, conduct the first resolution. Uh, in Poland, so so also uh, it should be taken into account that the, 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 uh, to prepare to building the uh, institutional capacity uh, uh, takes time. So thank you very much for for for, for this part. Artur, дуже дякую вам за так будь цікавий екскурс. Thank you so much for exposing us to the Polish practices. I have a question about the regulation now, so could you tell us about the best resolution practices? Because liquidation is not the best option, so what are the other options, better options? And who should be the key participants in that process? The guarantee fund, the regulator, and when is it the best time to do it? Like, how can you see that a bank is in trouble? When can you see it? Maybe you could think of an example, uh, just a case in point. Thank you for the question. Uh, I would say that uh, um, uh, sometimes the liquidation of the bank is better uh, solution than the resolution itself. I need to say that uh, we need to be also remember that uh, the banking uh, recovery and the resolution directive is not only the resolution, uh, because many institutions uh, and a lot of people, uh, uh, especially politicians, one uh, think that the resolution is a much tool to resolve of the, all the problems. In fact, it's not. And uh, we usually uh, uh, need to justify what is the better option uh, and what is uh, what we call uh, no cre creditors wars of rule. Uh, it means that uh, this resolution we need to be sure that the depositors and uh, and creditors will be not treated uh, in the less favorable way than in, uh, for example, in the bankruptcy proceedings or the orderly liquidation, because uh, I draw your attention to the fact that the banking uh, uh, BRRD uh, directive is about the resolution and orderly 
liquidation. So it means that in order to uh, to uh, let the bank uh, bankrupt or uh, be liquidated in a, a non uh, mm, a proper way, uh, we can safeguard the orderly. Uh, order uh, liquidation uh, and this is uh, this is very important uh, uh, sometimes the resolution is the not the best solution uh, sometimes liquidation is better some uh, sometimes uh, bankruptcy is better what is important in my opinion is uh, that uh, that uh, there is no banks too big to fail of course, this concept of the bank too big to fail uh, is uh, still uh, still uh, discussed, and of course, uh, in some countries, some jurisdictions, there are there are bank uh, banks that are too big to fail. Uh, but uh, in case of Poland, uh, we uh, conduct three. Uh, as far uh, uh, three resolution uh, cases, and uh, it touched the small bank, middle sized bank, and also bank that uh, was a systemic one. So uh, it show our motivation to the market that there is no so called holy cows. I mean that uh, boards and managers in the banks. Uh, needs to be aware that in case of uh, uh, bad behavior on the market, uh, and if the supervisors uh, will uh, be run off uh, their uh, uh, supervisory tools and measures, uh, they simply uh, will be resolved or liquidated or bankrupt. Uh, so we have the uh, big uh, uh, re instruments to address the problem bank uh, issues. And uh, well, the, 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 your question uh, about the uh, what is the right stage, uh, I think that uh, it will be hard to address in the, the, the very um, short uh, time that we have because we can write a book about this, uh, but we need to uh, uh, take into account uh, the criteria that are uh, uh, from directive. Uh, it must be public interest, it must be critical function of the banks, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the most uh, one of the most important criterion, the role of the bank in the financial uh, uh, sector and risk that this bank generates to the financial stability. Uh, and of course, we uh, uh, have in common discussion, we uh, prepare some kind of um, model that we uh, have with our supervisory colleagues. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, it's a very, very discretional uh, issues and also uh, very, uh, uh, because I don't say that, that sometimes we discuss with our supervisory colleagues that, uh, okay, uh, they say, for example, that we use all the tools, and but we say, no, you have another one. And then uh, when they really uh, run off of their uh, action or uh, their tools, that is time for us to step in. Okay, thank you. Pan Artur, duże dziękuję za odpowiedź. To to. Thank you so much for the answer. That's an interesting thing. One more short question, and then we're going to have it from other panelists. What's the existing guarantee amount in Poland right now? Uh, this, this is uh, uh, common for the European you know, countries, uh, and uh, 100,000 euros. Uh, Poland is not in the eurozone, so we pay equivalent in body. But uh, this, this sum uh, would uh, guarantee for the most of the Polish citizens uh, cover their deposits. 98% uh, are uh, covered by this uh, sum of 100. Пане Артур, дуже дякую. Пані Олена Жнек, а які, яка сума покривається зараз системою гарантування? 
So what is the current amount in the Ukraine for that and what are the plans of the DGGF for the future? It should be up to 400,000 grave now and start in 2023 it's going to be 600,000 grivna and this will allow to cover 99% of all investors in the banking system amount wise it's going to be about 60% our target will be 100,000 euro and we need to get there over the next 10 years all right thank you Elena, there is a question for you. If you make a bigger guarantee amount, will you get more deposits in the banking sector? Thank you for this opportunity to join you here. Well, as far as we can see, once the amount has been increased, there's going to be 10 to 15 percent increase in deposits we could see the effects of the COVID on the status of the banking system people started saving more recently people would typically make deposits in their current accounts It is something that you can use quickly if you need to get some money. So you would go ahead and take the money whenever you need it. So I think we should expect an increase in income and deposits so there can be a growth of liabilities and more people will choose to make deposits. If you want to make a deposit of 1 million grivna, for that to happen you need to open 5 deposits in 5 banks to 100,000 each. Or you can make that one big deposit in the Oshet Bank. Only Oshet Bank can guarantee the safety of that deposit for you right now. And secondly, the investors will be more certain, they will be able to trust the system more and as Svetlana told us there's going to be a growing awareness of people about that and that's why we can see that we trust the system more and that's why we would expect growing liabilities okay so if you increase the guarantee amount would that be of interest to international investors, not just domestic investors, like people from neighboring countries, will they start investing in this country? Because so far it hasn't been much interest to them. I think it's going to be more interesting now because non-residents are also covered by these practices, so it's 200,000. In 2012 this amount was 200,000 and now it is 200,000 so it's more than 7,000 euro but when you make it 20,000 euro in future then it's going to be a lot more interesting if you look at the interest rates especially in Grivna I think it covers the inflation rate pretty much and our interest rates look better than those in Western banks or elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Okay, Elena, I have a question for you. You say that the guarantee amount will be going up. We know that the DG DGF right now is experiencing some financial instability because it owes a lot to the government to the Minister of Finance. So what are you going to do about that? Just to settle the debts and then you will gain more financial stability and then you will be able to make the guarantee amount 600,000 and maybe more. 
Yes, DGF has faced a few financial and economic crises and they affected the banking system and the guarantee workload. The first crisis was in 2004. It was a political thing, primarily. But the NB responded to that effectively and in the short term we avoided bank bankruptcy because nobody could close their deposits in the banks. So as a result there was no extra financial burden. The second crisis happened in 2008. It also affected the banking system. This crisis was anticipated, so the government prepared in advance. They made an anti-crisis law. So the idea was to offer extra funding for the guaranteed system. The source of funding was the NBU. They offered extra funding. It could be at least one billion grivna. Because of that, the guarantee system got two billion worth of additional funding. And when banks begin going bankrupt, they were able to pay 3.7 billion grivna. So that law allowed the guarantee system to keep working uninterruptedly, offering compensations and reimbursements. Then the 2014-2016 crisis came around. It followed certain political disruptions and the banking system at that time had lots of other issues. So in 2014-16 more than 50% of the banks went bankrupt and financial burden on the guarantee system was more than 90 billion grivna which is 33% of the entire guarantee amount under the law on guarantee system. The financial liability is 2.5%. So the crisis was 13-fold the threshold that was established in the law. We would think of different ways of responding to it. We needed extra funding to secure the guarantee, but that extra funding was a huge amount, so we looked at some other options and eventually we chose to offer loans to the guarantee system and we did it at market rates. Interest was 10 to 12.5 percent and the guarantee system took that option and got 80 billion grivna worth of extra funding. So, as far as we can see, over the next 20 years in the guarantee system, we're going to need to gain all of the funding from the banking system to pay off the debts. Since 2018, the DGF has started restructuring its debts. The Minister of Finance allowed us to pay the debts that we had vis-a-vis -vis them. So about 14 billion grivna worth of interest had to be paid before 2031. Speaking of restructuring, we involved experts from the World Bank and the IMF at the expense of the technical support from the BRD, the DGF has been able to gain experts like Lazard, KPMG, Freshfold Echo, and they helped us find a good way of restructuring the debts. Then an MOU was made with the IMF and they set the deadlines for taking care of the debts. That's the end of 2021. The Council on Financial Stability adopted a plan 
to take care of the funds that's within the deadline set. They drafted a law in collaboration with the MPs and back in May of this year this draft law was registered in Supreme Council. In the late June of this year the Supreme Council took this draft as a basis. DGF still has debts to the government, 111 billion grivna, and it's the principle of the loan for the 7 billion grivna, and 64 billion is the accrued interest which should be paid back till 2031. You mentioned the draft law. If it becomes a law, then what's going to happen? Like, what consequences will it have for the investors, government, everybody else? Well, if it becomes a law, then the guarantee system will regain solvency. The DGF will be able to amass funds in order to overcome upcoming crises. And speaking of investors, well, the guarantee amount will be made 600,000 gradually. As for banks, Oshet Bank of Ukraine will become a part of the system and in future the guarantee will cover life insurance companies and credit unions. But what's the portion of the debt? The draft will not rescind the debt. It will split the debt into two parts. So the loan principle, which is for the 7 billion grivna, and that's going to be tied to the revenues from the banking system that we collect regularly. The fund will only think of the amounts that exceed the funding we need to cover the future crisis. The other part of the debt is the interest accrued and it's going to be tied to the funds that are going to be coming to the fund from the banks under liquidation. Some of these funds will be tied to affiliated persons. These are the funds that the DGF is going to get from the affiliated persons because their failure has led to a bank bankruptcy. So the draft suggests that we need to make affiliated persons responsible for the losses experienced by lenders. Okay, I have a question for Victor. Restructuring envisions two or three sources of funding as far as I can see. So one of them is reimbursement that you get from affiliated persons. So could you tell us more about that? I mean, what has been done to make it happen? What are the plans? How can you make sure that the source becomes a real deal? So that debtors could help resolve this debt. We typically speak about particular money and persons and the amounts are well known. I'd like to say hello and welcome to all participants. That's an inter interesting discussion happening here. Speaking of accrued interest, well, the guarantee fund will get these reimbursements from the affiliated persons because they had caused the banks to fail. This crisis has not been happening inside the bank. I mean, this crisis has swept across the whole sector. It's been a statewide problem. And that's why the government has to take care of that. The managing director said earlier that they had established a working group, a task force, to help regain the assets of bankrupt banks. The Prime Minister is taking care of this, and we are a part of this group too. We work in subgroups. There are two subgroups under that task force. One of them 
works with the law enforcement sector like general prosecutor's office and DGF. They investigate criminal cases. We have submitted more than 25 lawsuits against particular persons under criminal proceedings and uh, all of that is going to become a court trial. The total amount of all that is about 30 billion grivna. And apart from the lawsuits, we're also collecting evidence. So there is a good interaction between DGF and the law enforcement sector. And it helps both of us do a better job in collecting evidence of guilt. Because we need to get reimbursements in the first place. So we need to collect the evidence of guilt of affiliated persons which has hurt a particular bank. So this interaction pays off in civil cases, in economic courts and also in criminal proceedings. But the DGF worked on these things before the group was established. There is Article 52 of the Law on Deposit Guarantee. So we started doing that a few years earlier. So we made more than 50 lawsuits against more than 700 persons and the total of that is more than 100,000 billion grivna. Those cases are addressed by economic courts. So since we started doing that three years ago, many are asking us about the results. Since we talk about hundreds of millions of grievances, it's been like a new development in the judicial sector in this country. Previously, we would have only two cases like that, and they involved two persons, and the amount was not too big. So the cases involved a legal entity, which was led to bankruptcy, and we didn't have judicial practices in place to handle those cases adequately. Uh, still, it is something that is so hard to handle. The courts do not have particular way of handling that, they don't have experience with that, they don't have procedural practices in place. So these cases keep going back and forth. So it's going hard, really. So nobody actually wants to address those civil cases in courts. Out of 65 cases, more than 50 have been suspended. So it all went up to the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court and that one case went up the chain and it took two years for them to address the case. In the late May, we could see some court ruling and some believe that it's been like a break. So the DGF won the case. That was a case of Ukrakov Spilka Bank, so the court found in favor of the DGF. But the most important thing is not that we have been able to make the affiliated persons pay, but we are still expecting to get full size of court ruling on that matter so that other courts could look into that and see what they could do about the cases they're supposed to handle. So it should become like a showcase and I think soon we're going to get the full text of the court ruling and then we're going to be able to unfreeze other cases that are pending across the Ukrainian courts because they will be able to see what was done by the Grand Chamber in that ruling and I guess they will be able to address their respective cases pretty much the same way and that's gonna set things in motion. We also hope 
that foreign jurisdictions might help us. Everybody knows that the key beneficiaries are bank owners. And most of them, as well as their assets, are found abroad. In English jurisdiction, there are established practices in handling such cases, so we can procure services of foreign law firms, like the top 10 law firms. So we did 17 procedures of procuring such services. We made about 10 contracts with the law firms in other countries so that they could track those assets and help us recover them. Uh, the total of that could be about 21 billion that involves 14 banks. But that's just the beginning and we're intending to procure the procedures for 14 more banks. That's going to be 25 billion more grivna. So if you involve foreign jurisdictions, that's quite an expensive business and it takes a lot of time. But nobody would ever say it's going to be easier. If you want to get back hundreds of billions of grain or worth of damage, that's not an easy thing and it cannot be handled within a year or two. So we are expecting that the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court will make a positive decision on that. And then even in foreign jurisdictions, they will be able to refer to this ruling because the whole thing is about Ukrainian banks that have been affected, that have been bankrupt at the end of the day. So I think this working group will remain and it will continue doing its job. We we'll work with the law enforcement sector pretty successfully, as I told you. And that allows us to start judicial procedures which would allow to arrest assets in other countries of the world. I know of a case of one bank. I cannot tell the name of this bank right now because the assets are abroad, but we've got a break with that. And this working group also seeks to prepare the right legislation in order to retrieve assets and uh, we will continue working on that. The Supreme Council took on the draft law 4546 and that considers the judicial practices we have had so far. Uh, that draft, if it's going to be signed soon enough, then we're going to be able to have the courts address the respective cases more rapidly. Uh, this draft does not envision any new powers, but if you look at the specific nature of the proceedings we have had so far, I think it's going to allow us to work more rapidly in courts. The association was sort of concerned about that as far as I could see. They said that the staff of banks may fail to decide to offer a loan. But what we're thinking of is not just about making affiliate persons pay, but we're also thinking of prevention of such violations so that nobody would choose to drain so many assets from the bank. So we're monitoring all of that and the members of the lending committee and the board and the supervisory board would have to think hard before they choose to offer a loan. So prevention should be an important factor. So we will see how it's going to go. I can see things are making progress across the banks here and there. We still haven't seen any of the banks draining many of their assets abroad or something like that. So the deposit guarantee system will help preserve bank assets. 
And lastly, everything that we do is to meet the needs of the lenders, the government. So the draft suggests that all of the money we're going to get as a result of civil or criminal cases will come to the DGF and there there is they're going to be distributed among the lenders in a particular order of priority well thank you so much for telling us about all that just one more short question it's been six years since many banks were in trouble and what are your expectations because you know the score so what are your expectations in terms of uh, amount of funds you can get as a result of court rulings are you expecting that to happen over the next three years maybe five years speaking of the ukrainian jurisdiction well once the grand chamber of the supreme court have made the ruling then we start getting cases handled in the courts the cases that have been frozen there because the courts can refer to the ruling of the grand chamber it's hard to tell you when it's going to happen hopefully just like in the foreign jurisdiction courts it's going to be 2024 2025 so at least all of those cases will be addressed essentially So 2023, 2024, I think these are the years that we're going to see the first rulings made by courts in Ukraine. Right now we've got 64 lawsuits addressed in the Ukrainian courts, 780 persons involved. The total of assets is not too big because most of the assets are now abroad and we will depend on what the foreign courts are going to rule and that should allow us to regain at least some of those assets retrieve some of them so the guarantee system might see that a certain bank is in trouble and they're going to have enough time to see what to do about it. We have Olga Belight, the deputy managing director, so I have a question for you. What are the lessons that the fund has learned, the DGF has learned so far? What were the key bottlenecks, challenges? in terms of bank resolution. Well, we can think of taking care of the aftermath of the crisis of 2014-2016. 99 banks went bust, more than 50% of the banking system. They had assets worth more than 500 billion grivna, that's 40 billion dollars US, but their value was five times less than that as we could see. The DGF tried different ways. They would sell a bank, all of it, that's one option. And the largest bank in the country became a part of the state property. Then they can create a transitional bank and then they can sell it to the investor. Or they can sell assets and liabilities of the problem bank to other banks. But the most preferred option was liquidation as we could see nearly nine percent of banks in this country have been resolved through other options other than liquidation why so we can think of two major reasons behind it firstly poor quality of assets or no liquid assets at all in the bank and that's why we could not get from investors a good enough proposal based on the value of those assets. Sometimes investors would not make an offer at all because there were poor quality assets on the bank balance sheet. And secondly, lack of time. Lack of time to organize quality due diligence, 
to do the bank exposure in the market to find a potential investor who could be interested in those assets and liabilities. So it's hard to do it if you're limited in time. So basically we can see that there is a need to do something before the bank has become insolvent. So there should be an early intervention. In the course of bank resolution we have been able to meet the needs of individuals as lenders in the bank. We met almost all of the needs of the legal entities in the bank. In some banks, once we have done that, the remaining property would be transferred to shareholders. When it comes to liquidation, 23% of needs of lenders have been met, although we had created a transparent market of selling assets, but still in most of those cases a resolution worked a lot better than liquidation in terms of meeting the needs of investors and lenders of the bank. So we can see that we need to build a system of early response and we need to make sure the bankruptcy doesn't happen. If it does happen, because sometimes you can't prevent it totally, it's a natural thing, so sooner or later it might happen. But you gotta be ready for this, and you gotta have enough information, and you gotta prepare for this in advance. You mentioned early response, that's an interesting thing, so what should be done to let you see that a certain bank is in trouble, or potentially in trouble, so what is early response to you as a DGF? There are different signs of a bank being in trouble. We monitor all banks and in doing that we work with the regulator and we communicate with them quite well. We have a set of indicators and they allow us to see if certain problems are there cropping up. There is a specific indicator that allows us to see if a bank should be taken out from the market on time. We look at the bank assets to see if they are enough to cover the deposits. So in case of insolvency, the fund will have enough of that to cover the losses. So when a push comes to shove, the bank will sell some of the assets or they will take a collateral at an elevated value. So assets might lose value over time. We also see that sometimes a bank attracts deposits within a guarantee amount. They aggressively try to get more sources from the market. They offer to people very high interest rates. Sometimes they are too high compared to a market average. So to us all of that suggests that that bank is sort of high-risk bank. We look at the balance between the worth of assets and the guarantee amount. If that balance is negative, if it goes down to 1, or assets are less than deposits in value, then it's too late to do something, typically, you know. So, it is important that we make an early response. After the crisis, we have gained extra powers and we work with a bank when it is becoming a troubled bank. So it actually means that we designate an officer which will take care of this problem bank. That officer will give us all sorts of information that we need. And based on that we're going to be able to make a resolution plan in case of insolvency. We make a preliminary assessment of the bank's assets, but we still hope that the bank itself, gently with the regulator, will do everything they should to help the bank resume its operations. But we always want to make an ideal thing, so we start working with the bank when it's still healthy. At that stage we assess the capital buffers, we make draft regulation or resolution plans for the banks in case in case of potential trouble. So if a trigger happens, so a financial standing of the bank goes down, the bank starts resuming its operations and at that point the DGF will be able to undertake active steps, like we're going to check on the information, we're going to assess the worth of assets of the bank, we will make a data room 
so that we could work with the potential investors of that bank timely. So if all of that is done appropriately, then a resolution will be a typical option of taking the bank out of the market. And that means we're going to be able to preserve the funds of the lenders and investors, and they're not going to lose their money if a bank leaves the market especially if some other banks are also going bust within a short period of time. There was a question about collaboration with the regulator, the NBU. So it's a question for Yaroslav. So what is early warning in the eyes of the regulator? How does this work in Ukraine? And is there any difference from the international practices in this regard? Jointly with the fund and the international partners, the World Bank, we are implementing the European Directive resolving problem banks. We made the white book and pretty soon it will hopefully be used based on initiated legislative changes which allow for supervision and bank resolution. So it's work in progress, and uh, we are drafting legislative changes. The changes that were made previously, the supervisory interests which were provided previously, allow us to say that we are in line with the world's best practices in this regard. It is safe to say that The supervisory agency, like the NBU, can organize a temporary administration at the early response stage. The DGF is involved in taking the bank out of the market, but there are ongoing discussions about this and other things. It's about distributing competencies between the DGF and the NBU, and I guess pretty soon we're going to be able to see interesting initiatives. The National Bank, the NBU, came up with the assessment methodology and this allows to detect problem banks and then we can respond to that at an early stage in order to avoid bankruptcy and liquidation. All right, thank you. One of the early response tools is a stress test. Is that a part of this package? Stress testing is indeed one of the things that allows us to assess the bank's viability and the idea is actually to aid in financial and bank instability. So stress testing because of the COVID was not done last year, but now we're doing it again. So third, the banks are now getting stress tests. They account for 90% of the total of the assets in the country. We're going to see the results of stress tests in this coming fall, and we're going to publish them towards the end of the year. All right, thank you. There is one more thing I'd like to discuss right now. Alana mentioned the draft law and said that Oshet Bank would become a part of the deposit guarantee system. So I have a question for Sergey. So Oshet Bank was a preferred bank in the market, but as it becomes a part of the guarantee system, is that a good thing or a bad thing for it? What does it mean for the investors of that bank? The government seeks to make sure that the banking market could operate in a fair manner and there should not be any banks that enjoy extra preferences. So OSHA Bank should become a part of the DGF and that was discussed since 2016 or so. 
Nowadays, Societ Bank welcomes this draft. It's been approved in the first reading, and I hope it's going to be okay in the second reading. So now, speaking of the government guarantees, the government cannot give you money for no reason. The idea is to help you pay your debts to the investors, and that's why we should think of capitalization. So, the government gave Oshet Bank some capital so that the bank would stand the crisis and would keep all of the investors and depositors there. We can now become a part of the guarantee fund, but till 2025 we will still be a state-run bank. Under the banking law, a shareholder, a state or a private shareholder is supposed to supply capital to the bank. If it's going to be 600,000 as a guarantee amount, then investors will not have to distribute their deposits across different banks. So nowadays Societ Bank is very liquid, so liquidity-wise in assets it is quite a significant portion. We are capitalized, the capital adequacy is 15%. So far this year Operating profits will be 3.5 billion. That's that's a record. The DGF will get a contribution. There's going to be regular contributions, and that's how the fund will be able to replenish its insurance contribution for payments. And also, as a member of the DGF, it gets a stable bank, which will be operating steadily, and there's going to be no problem with that. So nothing changes really for our investors. The bank is sta stable and steady in every way. So we're still a state-run bank, and in case of any crisis, the government will support this bank. And also, we are a profitable, self-sufficient bank. We're liquid enough in order to meet all of the commitments vis-a-vis -vis our investors. We have been discussing that since 2016, and we have seen the first reading of the draft, and we will see what's going to happen to our investors and deposit portfolios. It all has been growing. We had a 5 billion increase in people's deposits with the bank, so it's all right. Oshet Bank will become a part of the DGF. It will set the right conditions in the banking market, and this will help increase quality of service. There's going to be more competition between banking products in the market, and it will help the bank remain stable. Since your bank becomes a part of the DGF, what does this mean to the DGF? Let's have it now. So, it's an important development for us because we gain a financial, financially steady participant. What Oshet Bank did was a tremendous work. In 2001, they were making the law on deposit guarantee, and at that time there was an idea to involve Oshet Bank. But there have been some problems there. We still have a lot of deposits which were made back under the USSR. The bank was not in the best shape at that time, so they decided that the financial ability for this bank should be taken uh, by the government. So a year ago, we negotiated again with the Oshet Bank and international partners, and right now it's a comfortable situation for the bank and the DGF to get together, and it's been an important step to us. 
So the law envisions the peculiarities of making Ocean Bank a part of the DGF. There's going to be a three years period during which Ocean Bank will be getting certain preferences. But the idea is that the DGF, the government and the bank would get synergy and efficiency and it would allow the guarantee system to match the world's best practices. So indeed, there should be a single system of guarantees in the government and it's going to be the same thing for all banks. Elena, could you possibly tell us how other banks are looking at this? So now that the Oshid Bank is going to make it to the DGF, so what do they think? Well, I was in favor of seeing Oshid Bank become a part of the DGF, because otherwise it would be an unfair competition. It's a state-run bank at the end of the day, and the government would use the taxpayer's money, in case of trouble, to add to the capitalization of this bank. And um, there is a strong guarantee for this bank, and uh, if I have like 200,000, then as a citizen I can make it something. Instead of splitting this up into little deposits here and there, I could find a much better way. I could go to Oshet Bank, I could deposit 200,000 grivna or more than that, and I could do this in one package. So, we spoke with overseas colleagues and Oshet Bank people, and we really need for this bank to become a part of the DGF, and it's going to be quite a benefit for the banking system. So hopefully it's going to happen like this pretty soon. And there is going to be no bank in the market enjoying special preferences or benefits. Well, that's indeed a big step towards implementing the strategy from the Cabinet of Ministers. So by 2025 we're supposed to be ready to be fully or partly privatized. We keep in touch with the EBRD all the time and this draft law is one of the triggers allowing us to embark on the active stage and towards the end of the year we should be able to make the first step in order to make a BRD have a share in the capital of the bank. In the second reading we expect all of that to be addressed and passed, so we hope that draft will become the law as soon as possible. The deposit portfolio has been growing, as you say, so you get more deposits from people coming in. In the deposit guarantee system, is there any way to influence the investors? I mean, the deposit portfolio of individuals might not be growing any longer. Well, tell me about any bank out there today, apart from our bank, which could have 100% government guarantee. There is no alternative. It puts us all in equal conditions. So, we're going to compete for the quality of service and deposit rates. Right now, we cannot see a drop in the number of investors, and I'm convinced that the deposit portfolio will remain the same. Since earlier this year we had lowered the rates, the market was going towards lower deposit rates, and we haven't lost the investors nevertheless, and we're not going to lose any, because we're quite a large, stable, well-capitalized bank. And if we make if we make it to the DGF, it's going to give us extra benefits. Although there was a difference between uh, among the banks in terms of the guarantee amount, still we had an increment across the entire banking system. It was 20% or so. There is an association between the status of Oshet Bank and other banks. So. 
there's going to be no major effect from this on the deposits that we have in the banking system. So the investors in other banks will not be suffering consequences. There is banking market. There is a bank there which has 18% of the entire bank. There is a fund that guarantees the protection of deposits to the entire market. And it's not paid by the fund. The fund cannot make enough savings for the provisions. But if they have us as a part of the DGF, then the fund will gain extra financial capacities to offer reimbursements and to keep increasing the guarantee amount to make it like the amount in Poland or something like that. So I guess that's going to be an important step. Osha Bank says that the average deposit size there is much larger than what you get across the rest of the banking system on average. All right. Not only in Oshad Bank, but across the entire system, there is an upward trend. People are saving more, and that allows us to see an increase in the deposit base. Towards the year end, there's going to be 26% increase in that. That's what we expect to happen. And then there's going to be a full blown competition. Oshad Bank becomes a part of the DGF. They're not going to compete against the Cheddar's banks. But there will be competing in terms of services and digital solutions. As the COVID crisis showed, banks have been able to quickly adapt to digitalization. It took us a month in order to go digital, so most of the banks have responded quickly. All of their back offices and everything have started working digitally and that's a new development and it's very telling. So Oshad Bank has to go digital too and I can see they're doing that. So the banks are ready in to see you become a part of the DGF and then they will compete in terms of services and uh, interest rates. All right, thank you. I'd like to speak about other market players. The European Directive says that not only deposits of individuals are covered, but also legal entities' deposits and other market players' deposits are covered too. Artur actually told us that the Polish fund works with individuals and other market players. So I wonder, what are the plans of the DGF in this country? So Oleg, are you intending as a fund to involve other market players? Well, we keep looking at the European legislation, that's our lodestar, and it doesn't matter where an individual takes their money to, to a bank or a non-banking institution, that deposit must be protected. That's going to be the next step in terms of making sure that deposit guarantee system covers non-banks, which involve deposits from citizens. So once the split has been completed and non-banking institutions came under the supervision of the NBU. In Ukraine, credit unions can also receive citizens' deposits. They need to be licensed for that, and then they can do it. In this country, you get about 170 credit unions. The total of investments in them is 1 billion 400 million grivna. That's not too much. 600 million grivna is what you get in the banking system right now. So that's less than 1%. Why so? The credit union market has been getting nowhere fast for a long time, so they didn't have enough capacities. So if you have guarantees from the DGF, then we would expect credit unions to be doing better, and their investors would feel more protection, more stability, as they take their deposits to credit unions. And we have seen something like that 10 years ago. So the DGF offered guarantees to banks, and after that, people started taking their money to the banks. 
So hopefully the same will happen in the credit union market and we're going to see the same happening there among non-banking institutions. Thank you. You mentioned the split and that's why I have a question. The National Bank has become a regulator of non-banks as well. So could you briefly tell us about your vision of the market of non-banking institutions, especially the ones that are licensed credit unions? Are you expecting to see more of them, less of them in the market? As far as we can see, credit unions market is stagnating right now. A split was done a year ago and you could see 20 credit unions evolving. One of them obtained a license and we have seen pretty much the same in previous years and it allows me to say that that market is not going anywhere. It's not looking good right now. The commitments that have been picked up under the European Directive suggest that we need to offer guarantees to credit unions as well. So we drafted a new law on credit unions, by the way, and hopefully it will produce an impetus in the credit union market. There will be new developments there, new social initiatives like condominiums, agrarians, micro-businesses, they might choose the services of the credit unions. All of that is not a part of the current law, so that's why we produced a new draft. Okay, you represent the credit unions, so tell us about this. If you become a part of the guarantee system as a credit union, is that a benefit to you or not? Hello everybody! I'd like to first of all thank you for inviting me over. It's a representative conference and I represent a small institution and still I can speak here. So my credit union is very little really. The Oshet Bank board chair appreciates it I guess. But finally in the credit union market something begins to move. At least we got some attention from the heavyweights in the market. They quoted some statistics earlier and that sounded so pessimistic. But I can tell you that this market is making some progress slowly but surely. We can see growing lending portfolios over time. And there is some hope that we're going to become a part of the DGF system and we would have our identity there. Since 2001, the banking system would not consider us as competitors, but in the cities and the small towns where we operate, we are your competitors. We are competitors vis-a-vis -vis your branches and sometimes we win that competition. So, that's what we are like. The market was not stagnating so much since 2001. We didn't wait for 2020 to arrive, so in the meanwhile, we tried to organize certain mechanisms of guaranteeing deposits. Sometimes we would use an insurance company in order to make sure that our members get their deposits back in case of trouble. We also used the services of the German project that was the Deposit Protection Program and we showed the healthy portion of the market. They would disclose their reports in public and we could build the rankings of credit unions and investors could get an idea and obtain a guarantee. It's been a positive development all in all. We make 10 to 15 percent of the market because we are little institutions and 
You often refer back to the 2014 crisis, but there was one before that in 2008. So in 2008, they would organize banks, and sometimes politicians would be involved in that, and other affiliated persons, and we would work with them, and we could see these banks having fancy premises that would run their commercials on the top television channels. But in 2008 and in 2014, many of those banks collapsed, but credit unions typically survived, and they're still around. I don't know how it looks like statistically, and how much of a growth we're going to see, but I think there will be some growth, and the DGF system is the right thing, people get guarantees on their deposits, so that thing showed its capacities in other countries, especially the younger generation of people in this country, wants to have some simple and understandable mechanisms in place, protecting their deposits. My credit union has been around for 29 years now. Not too many banks in Ukraine can boast that longevity. and uh, we never got any particular assistance from the National Bank or the Ministry of Finance. We never, get, we never gained any financial support. We have seen the crisis of 2008, 2014 and some more. Back in 2014 there was this trouble crisis and my credit union lost its own deposits because we were a legal entity in one of the banks, so we lost our deposits, we could not do any refinancing, so we had to get over it. But in that setting, our depositors, our investors were not hurt. So, we are expecting more deposits to come. I think we're going to typically have younger investors because our instruments are more understandable to them. But for that to happen, we're going to keep on working hard. And you speak of digitalization, we are on it. We use online solutions, other things, so we are on it. Actually, you already answered my second question, like, if you become a part of the guarantee system, will you expect more deposits to come? And you said, yes, you're expecting that to happen, although it might not be the key driver behind making a part of the system. But again, there's one more question to you. Do you think the credit unions are ready to see the changes in the law and the requirements that they have on them? I mean, a change in the management practices, like the new office that you should have their like risk manager and so on. Well, we have to be ready for that, that's what I can tell you. Because that's what the law requires. There are methodologies that are used in the DGF and uh, the National Bank places those requirements on us. So every credit union should match that, should meet those requirements, and they all have to do something to be around. If you do it formally, like if you introduce new offices, new positions, this by itself is not enough, it's not good enough. Because the financial institution, in spite of doing that, might still fail. A bank or a credit union can be in that trouble. So, as you keep telling us about 2014, 50% of the banks left the market instead of having particular procedures in place. So, procedures themselves mean nothing. We are little institutions compared to banks, and if this new law on credit unions happens, we have to be ready for that because we will have new positions, like internal auditor, that's been a new position to us as well a few years ago. But it didn't change much in the operations of the credit unions. It didn't affect us at all. We have been around for 29 years, as I told you, and 
we are responsible for the deposits from citizens. So we operate in small towns and we are personally responsible for what we're doing. Many other institutions in the market have standard established procedures. Maybe they are not formalized enough, so the DGF or the NBU could help us with that in order to make it a part of our procedures and practices. But still, I can tell you that Well, the chair of the board of the Oshut Bank said that if they make a part of the DGF, they're going to be a reliable and powerful partner. But in some parts of the market, you're going to get reliable partners in the shape of the credit unions, because we are personally responsible for what we're doing. Very often, our board chairs and boards work for a long time, and they have to be reliable, they have to gain the trust in the market by showing good performance. We sometimes cannot afford top experts which could take care of us in the whole country. We cannot afford commercials on central TV channels, which is why we operate locally and we try to do a quality job. Sometimes we cannot offer loans to some customers. We work with small producers, small businesses, farmers. They cannot get credit loans from the bank. Sometimes we cannot give them a loan either. I mean, it's painful, but sometimes we see we cannot do it. So, all in all, what I'm saying is that in the healthy part of the market, we're going to be your reliable partners because we are responsible for what we're doing. So that's our job, that's what we feel like doing. We actually believe that reliability of an institution is the first requirement. The Polish colleague spoke about capitalization. I can tell you that our credit unions are trying to save on certain things, so we operate very carefully so that all of the profits would be channeled into the capital. If we have to spend extra on new positions and so on, that's going to lower our capitalization. Last year was difficult to us, but we have seen good financial results, as good as in 2018 and 19. So, we're trying to keep it this way. And I don't know which way is it going to go, into the capital of the credit union, making it more reliable vis-a-vis -vis investors. Okay, thank you so much, and thanks to all of the panelists. So each of these things could be discussed at length for hours to an end. Arthur actually told us you can write a book about each of these questions. Well, the DGF has done a lot, as we can see, and there is still a lot on the agenda, but there is a clear understanding in the DGF about the implementation of European directives to increase the guaranteed amount to make it 400, 600, and then beyond that. You need to get more participants on board, credit unions and other non-banking institutions. Restructuring that will allow for financial stability of the fund. You work with affiliated persons, you do early response. Well, all of that matches the world's best practices, and it makes the guarantee system a better deal for the financial sector. So, thank you all for this discussion. I'd like to wish you all success in what you do, stay healthy, do good, be prosperous. And, uh, and there is one more point that I would like to make for all of the viewers watching us online. If you have any questions for the panelists, you're welcome to share them with us. We can take them as they come. Thank you, Yuri, and all of you folks. 
So those who are watching us online, and those are relevant points to the activities of the DGF, you're welcome to share your questions through Zoom, through the chat box, and uh, we have about 20 questions and counting, but let us know what you are and who is your question for. I'm not sure we're gonna go through all of the 20 questions, we have 30 minutes to go, and um, that's as much time as we have got. So, one of the questions is this. It's a question from Dmitry Grinkov, a reporter from Ministry of Finance. I think it's a question for Svetlana. So what do you guys think of the idea to abandon the government guarantees for foreign currency deposits in order to make this economy less dependent on foreign currency. Yeah, I heard about that question earlier. So what do we think about that? That was the question, right? Well, I can tell you this. No, we're not in favor of that, definitely. Because foreign currency deposits are also deposits and the DGF is the one that is supposed to guarantee all deposits in all currencies. But if we speak about reducing the share of foreign currency, well, we have a diversified system of payments from banks. So if a bank gets a lot of foreign currency deposits, they pay a different rate than a bank that gets more of the domestic currency deposits. It's a way of stimulating banks to involve preferably deposits in the national currency. So you're not punishing the, the investor for willing to make their savings in foreign currency, but it's about working more with the banks that get those kinds of deposits. So we are against abandoning the guarantee for foreign currency deposits, and all investors can be assured this will never happen. All right, one more question from the same guy. This one goes to the DGF. People. Okay, back to you, Olga. How many potential troubles and banks are there in the banking system right now? I think it's a question to the NBU, so Yaroslav. Okay, let's have it. We're going to check with the DGF, so if we need to see how many of them are potentially in trouble... Well, there are some banks that look troublesome, they fail to meet the regulations, and uh, they are trying to improve their ways, their practices, and they want to go back to stable operations. We hope they're going to be able to do it, and uh, we're not going to have to use Svetlana do something about that. Well, banks might go bust, you know. Sometimes it's their own business model or a risky asset policy. It can be whatever. So sometimes a bank does go bust. It's fine. You just need to allow this bank to resume operations, to recover. You also need to allow it to see if the bankruptcy of that bank can undermine the stability of the entire system. So Arthur was saying, right, it's important to assess that effect. If it's a big bank which operates in a faulty manner and it cannot generate profits, then there's no need to recover it. There's no need to try to do it this way or that way. You need to improve the system. The DGF will do its part of the job and it will help preserve the financial stability of the country. Speaking of stress testing, well, I may add by saying that 
the banks that are experiencing some problems right now are not a threat to the bank instability. So everything's fine, everything's under control, that's what I would say. It's 1% of the banking system, so it's not a big deal, and we're gonna keep it that way. So hopefully that 1% of the banks will do better. Well, you have to detect them on time and you have to minimize the risk. Yes, that's why the NBU is monitoring things, so as I told you, everything is under control. Next question for Svetlana. When will it be 100,000 euro guaranteed amount in this country? Arthur can tell you that it cannot happen overnight, you know. In Europe it's 100,000 euro and in most country that's the guaranteed amount. But it's not too often that this amount gets paid. The resolution happens at an early stage and uh, typically it never comes to paying that amount. And in the EU there have been many cases where the early resolution would be done and in spite of the crisis in 2008 and 2013 they would not pay it at the end of the day. So the directive says that you have to practice early response. You have to do it jointly with the national bank. And in that setting 100,000 euro will not be paid to everybody who is in trouble. This 100,000 is something that the banking system can afford and it might be like an incentive to see more deposits come into the system. But there is one more important thing. The DGF is undertaking steps towards making it 100,000 euro. Like, it's good to have it like that, but Ukraine might get there in 20 years. We have a particular schedule, and I told you about that, so we're gonna make incremental increases in this amount. We're implementing a directive. We have particular stages in the plan of implementing the directive. So 100,000 euro is not a dream. It's a plan with deadlines and is going to be implemented accordingly. The sooner this date arrives, the better to everyone. Yes. If you say the guaranteed amount is 100,000 euro, that's going to mean we did what we're supposed to, or even more than that. I spoke of the automated system of payments, so this is what we're going to build for the next generations to come. It will help them overcome the crisis more easily. If banks go bust, is this the fault of the bank manager or owners? Is there anybody else who could be guilty of that? Maybe the government, maybe somebody else? There is nobody else who could be guilty of that. I mean, we're out of options. So every owner is responsible for the business. They hire the management, which decide on the business model. All of that is assessed by the NBU, and the NBU is there to see if it's an adequate model or not. In the crisis of 2014 through 2017, we could see that, well, even back in 2008, we could see that every large businessman was supposed to have a bank. As a result of that, banks began to collapse, and about 100 banks left the market. Nowadays the banking system is stable and transparent. The National Bank supervises banks and they do it meticulously enough and uh, sometimes we're thinking of mitigating the supervisory practices, especially in terms of lending. There are certain things which could be done not so hard in this particular situation. In the state-run banks, the state is the owner, so uh, 
they are responsible for what those banks are doing, just like the commercial owners of other banks. In 2008, I wanted to make a deposit with one of the banks, and it took me four years to retrieve it from there. And I remember I spoke with the manager, and there was some other customer telling them, I brought the money to you, so now give it back to me. So if I bring my money to a particular institution, I need to see how can I get it back if I need it. If you go to a non-banking institution, you might think of it differently. So much depends on the rapport you have established with the manager and you believe that that manager will help you sort things out in your favor. Which is why we need to keep raising the financial literacy of people. So year after year, you got to tell them the right messages. And that's what the DGF is doing, the NBU and other institutions. It's, it's our joint effort and the results will crop in, in a year or two maybe. So it's not going to, it's not going to be seen very soon. One more thing. I think this question is good for Olga. Are you intending to cover the guarantee uh, to make this guarantee cover the accounts of legal entities? Under European law, it's like that. The legal entities accounts are under this guarantee. Since we are implementing the European legislation, or at least we do the approximation, then that's what we have to do. But it's not going to happen in half a year or a year. In order to make the guarantee cover all of that, we need to be able to make respective payments in case of trouble. So the DGF should be financially viable enough. So that decision should be well thought out and we should not rush into this. We need to be sure that as we commit ourselves to doing it, we should be able to do it. So that option is considered, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. We can make the guaranteed amount 400, 600,000, and it's going to happen sooner than that thing. But if it does happen, then it's going to be a real deal. Yeah, sure. Okay, next question. It goes to Olena Nuznenko. Are you intending to increase the size of deposit to the bank? because you're intending to increase the guaranteed amount. No, we're not going to demand an increase in regular deposits. The base rates will remain the same. Additionally, each bank will pay for the risk they have in their operations. So base rates will never change. But the banks pay extra into the guarantee system and that depends on the risks they have in their operations. Since Oshet Bank is going to come to you, you might think of it differently. But still, let's move on to the next question. It's for Sergey. Is Oshet Bank intending to go to the market of selling NPLs and when? Yeah, we have such plans. And there is a tool that we got from the Cabinet of Ministers. I think we're going to be the trailblazers in that. Although I've heard of some NPL portfolios being sold. We're making preparations, we're building drafting procedures, we need to see what criteria should we be guided by in doing that. So once we have done that, we would pilot it and then we would make it a real business. Okay, Svetlana, a question for you. Selling banks assets is almost over. NPL market should have attracted foreign investors, but why do you think this never happened? Because Ukrainian players offered better prices. When we had big sales, we would sell pools of assets. And that would involve international experts. They did the marketing of those pools. And we know that there have been potential investors in the data rooms checking out the assets. And among them, there were foreign investors. But in reality, a Ukrainian local player would offer a higher rate 
and that explains things. You know, foreign investors, they think of the risk of a country and currency risk and poor market awareness risk if you're a new player. If you're a local player, you have a better knowledge of the market and how can you do things if you cannot get a return on investment. So that's why it happened like this. If we go beyond this, I guess it's about protecting the rights of lenders and uh, it's about the attractiveness of this country as a recipient of investments. And uh, I'm speaking about courts, legislation, law enforcement sector and ways in which you can get your money back, your investments back. Okay, thank you. There's a question for the Polish participant, for Arthur Radomski. In the EU, there is some work going on improving the European directives of 2014-2016. Could you tell us what are the key expected changes and uh, is Europe getting closer to implementing this idea, like creating a pan-European system of guaranteeing deposits? Uh, okay, so uh, yes, that's true that uh, uh, we are currently uh, in the European Union. There are uh, processing two directives. One is called BR BRRD2, uh, uh, which is uh, amendment to the uh, directive of the BRR1. Uh, and this is amendment is uh, resulted from the experience uh, uh, from the different countries and different cases, uh, resolution cases in different countries. Mm, so it's uh, some kind of fine tune of the BRRD1. Uh, and as far as uh, uh, concern, the pan-European uh, deposit insurance system, uh, there is a, a discussion about the uh, uh, European deposit insurance system directive. Uh, and uh, the discussion uh, is uh, ongoing and uh, there are some, uh, some uh, pros and cons to this solution. Uh, uh, this is not an uh, easy moment uh, to, to, to have this one. Uh, well, as you remember, the, the, there are two, uh, three pillars of the uh, reform uh, after the crisis in the European Union. The first was establishing the single supervisory mechanism. Uh, the second pillar is, pillar is uh, the uh, single resolution board, so uh, cope with the uh, uh, problem banks uh, across the Europe, uh, including the uh, trans-border uh, um, trans groups. And the third, which complements to all this package of the regulation, is this so-called EDIS directive to build the pan-European um, deposit guarantee scheme. Uh, uh, what uh, what uh, we discuss right now is the, 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 the primary and basic and the fundamental question, because uh, to establish such an institution, pan-European institution, that the guaranteed deposit all over the Europe requires uh, uh, the same level of the uh, um, capital, the same level of the development of the banking sectors, and so on. Uh, so, for example, there is a, a lot of uh, contradictory voice that, for example, uh, it could be a um, very... Um, uh, systemically uh, dangerous uh, things that, for example, uh, let's say some countries from the south part of the Europe, uh, when they can have uh, problems in their banking systems, why the north countries should pay the, and guarantee the deposits uh, in these countries. So it's not an easy process, and uh, but uh, as far as we know that the European Commission is working on this issue, uh, but uh, there are, uh, let's say, that countries from the south part of the Europe, Italy, Spain, uh, even France, they are in favor, but Germany and other countries uh, are uh, rather uh, skeptical about this. Uh, so. Uh, 
uh, it should be discussed more, uh, I think, because uh, the one of the unique things that uh, we learn uh, from, from, from being a member of the European Union is that uh, you need to reach the consensus uh, that uh, all member countries will agree on the uh, proposed solution. If there are some countries uh, who are not agreed, uh, the, it, it will be very difficult to achieve. So I think that uh, uh, there is still discussion uh, going on on this pan-European deposit guarantees system, but uh, I think that the, 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 there is uh, not even set up the final date to, to achieve this document. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you for the answer. So, I think as soon as Ukraine becomes a member of the European community, then we're going to have 100,000 as a guaranteed amount, and then things will unlock. I think so. All right, next question to Yuri. It's about DGF for non-banking institutions. Is this enough to help the non-banking market develop, or will there be a need to do something else? At the legislation level, you cannot do much because the credit unions have to take initiative. That's the nature of their business. And uh, my union is willing to make progress to keep evolving and we support other credit unions. We have a sectoral association, even too. And uh, I think much depends on the credit unions themselves. They need to modify their practices, processes, they have to go digital much more. They have to come to terms with the modern tools in order to try and match the banking system, offering high quality services in typically small towns and communities where we operate right now. Thank you. A question to Yaroslav. Tell us about the stability of the banking system today. Can we expect post-COVID disruptions in that system? The banking system is stable, and uh, I would not expect any disruptions, any trouble after COVID. So it's not necessarily about COVID at all. Okay. A question to Olga Belay. Are you going to cover the funds that you gain from the life insurance companies with the DGF system. There is a strategy for developing financial sector of Ukraine till 2025, and it suggests clearly that DGF should cover credit unions and insurance companies, which offer life insurance services. There are different classes of insurance. It can be life insurance based on the risk, but in this case, the idea is to make it based on accumulated funds. So, with the NBU, we have a joint task force. And we need to do everything under the strategy. So, in 2023, that system is supposed to start working in this country. But we still have to do a lot to make it happen. So, we have to crunch the numbers rightly. And... Uh, Right now we're drifting a concept and we can see that in doing that we have to be in line with the National Bank as a regulator of insurance companies, but also we have to be in line with the companies themselves. So these companies should not be afraid of that. We're not going to get them to make large contributions, that's not the idea. We want to have a system in place which would be well balanced, allowing for development to happen. It's not going to be demands to those companies to pay more into the market. So we're on it. It might happen in a couple of years. But life insurance companies are some of the most conservative companies. Maybe they are the healthiest in their sector. Yeah, that's right, that's right, because there is a limit on the size of assets you can place. In bank, 80% of the 
are the lending portfolios. Those assets are more risk are riskier than those of life insurance companies. In those companies, 80% are deposits that you get in other banks. So the quality of those assets is better and there is less risk in the market for them. But the precondition for the guarantee system for the insurance companies and credit unions is a good quality of the market where these companies are. If you are a high-risk company and you operate in breach of the standards, in breach of the NBU regulations, well, those companies will not be covered by the system. All right, a question to Yuri. What do you think of the likelihood of post-COVID crisis in the world? Will it affect the banking system in this country? Well, you see, it's not an easy thing. They did a lot of analysis on that. KPMG did some There is an evolutionary thing about the banking sector. COVID has just created certain conditions. It triggered off things in the market. Many banks started making transformations. I would not expect any direct effects of the COVID on the banking system. I would expect some effects of the COVID on the business strategies and transformations of banks, like most of the banks are going digital, and we all can see it. Even before COVID, everybody would say there is a need to go digital to create new sales channels and so on. So this digital thing has just transpired in this setting. A global study shows that about 80% of CEOs of different companies, not necessarily in the financial sector, are ready to review their development strategy and one of the key things they consider doing is IT and digital solutions. Speaking of the digital solutions, the next question comes from Sergey Klimenko for Sergey Naumov. Is the bank intending to offer cash back in mobile banking? And what are the outlooks for the existing app, mobile app? We are updating the app. It's going to be a new one. We're working on that. I guess towards the end of the year, we're going to come up with a much better app featuring more functions, products, opportunities. So that new mobile app will be a great deal better. That's work in progress right now. And speaking of cashback, we will see how the situation will unfold in the market. Right now, we didn't do that sort of thing. So depending on the market, we'll see if we're going to go for it. I cannot say right now. The market will show. Well, cashback depends on the interchange and other commissions. So, you know, there was a draft law a while ago, which has been stopped. And there is now a memorandum on lowering the interchange little by little. And that affects the cashback. So, if interchange remains the way it is, then cashback will be the same too. If they start reducing the interchange, and there seems to be an agreement on that at the high level, then the cashback will be going down. Okay, a question to Victor. In the world, they use peaceful settlements. Is this an option for Ukraine? Well, in this country you can make peaceful settlements, why not? And the DGF in certain cases would do that. But the idea is this, you have to make sure that the staff of the DGF be safe and you have all of the conditions for peaceful settlements in the legislation. We will soon work with the Ministry of Justice to draft a law on peaceful citizens and voluntary pre-court settlements. So pretty soon 
we're going to work with the IMF experts and we're going to draft a law on peaceful settlements between the DGF and affiliated persons and owners of banks. Okay, there is a question from Stanislav Kartashov to Sergey Nomov. How the stability of the country will be affected by a new draft law that everybody is discussing these days? Lena? It's a tax-related draft law. They're going to make about 2,000 amendments to that, so right now it's hard to say what it's going to be like before the second reading. And there are three key things about that which are a potential trouble for the banking system. The land tax is, is one of them. If a land is collateralized and a bank takes it on its balance sheet and then has to pay taxes, but a bank is not an agrarian company, so it will be paying taxes once the land has been sold. So to us that's a very important thing. And then there are issues with the DPS. Well, that service gains wider powers. I, th I think she means state tax service. And uh, they will require information from banks and then they will be able to look through the paperwork and see if there is corruption there, how does that affect the stability of banks. Well, there are regulators that assess the bank's stability, resilience. And the third thing is about previous losses sustained by banks. The idea is that the idea is to consider only 50% of those, but we had so many crises before and it is clear that we should not do discounting, so it should be 0% as before. So these are the three key things to us. So 5600, that draft should be assessed in a couple of weeks' time when it's ready for the second reading. Many entrepreneurs are concerned about that too. Okay. A question to Yaroslav. Denationalization of banks. Tell us about where it's at and how much longer will it be going on? Should there be any state run banks in Ukraine at all? That's a good question. Well, the government has decided to do the denationalization of some banks. So they reduced the number of state-run banks. Also under the MOU with the IMF, we as a country are supposed to reduce the share of the government in the banking system down to 25%. It can be actually down to 20 in further plans, but right now we're thinking of making it down to 25%. There is a strategy which carries these targets approved by the cabinet of ministers and the banks are working along these lines. Ukrgas Bank signed a contract with IFC and new investors are supposed to enter the bank's capital pretty soon like in half a year's time or year's time it's gonna happen. One more bank is negotiating things with the EBRD. They're drafting their roadmap, allowing the EBRD to enter the capital of that bank. An important law has been passed allowing Oshut Bank to become a part of DGF and that's also a requirement for denationalization of Oshut Bank. Privat Bank well, there should be a new strategy approved by the Cabinet of Ministers pretty soon and um, they will see how private bank is going to be privatized. All right, thank you, I got it. So we have little time left, so with this I'd like to have each of you to do a very short summary of what we have discussed here. So, Elena? Just a few words to sum up the things here. 
Well, pretty soon the draft will be voted on in the second jury, and then the president will quickly sign it, and then it's going to take us to a new level of development of the DGF and the entire banking system here. If you work with somebody else's money, the bank management and owners need to remember it's not their money, it's investors' money. And also you, we have Article 52. It's still there, it's still in effect, and we will work accordingly. Okay? The GF is about financial stability of the country. We need to keep it like that. So hopefully the draft that is going to be addressed pretty soon will allow the DGF to do this job in full. We're expecting the second reading to happen soon. We will continue working with the BRD and then we will be able to start implementing our strategy to privatize the bank. Good. Uh, the GF wants to become a partner for the banking system and uh, all of this earlier response, that's all about partnership, trust and responsibilities. So I'd like to thank Yuri from the Credit Union who spoke about that. It's so important. Trust and responsibility are so important for the banking and non-banking market. We need to have an early response system so that the GF would not have anything left to do. It's been a year since we have been regulated by the National Bank and we are experiencing changes and uh, we are ready to keep moving on. So pretty soon we might become a part of the DGF and then we will be able to offer quality services to our members. A strong guarantee system is one of the key factors of the strong financial system in the country, so the DGF is moving in the right way. So I wish them to gain the best possible results in the shortest possible time. Back to you, Arthur, your final remarks. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation for this uh, prestigious event and uh, such an outstanding panelist. Uh, I am very privileged. And uh, as a general remark, I would like to say that uh, uh, we need to remember that uh, uh, financial institutions that take the deposit uh, from the, uh, their clients, from the citizens, uh, should be supervised and should be uh, part of the obligatory, uh, obligatory uh, deposit insurance system. And uh, I would like to say that the uh, financial institutions like banks, credit unions, uh, they should be even more interested uh, in uh, be a part of uh, this uh, deposit system because it builds the trust to their clients and depositors. Uh, it means that, for example, if uh, the, you have uh, the pledge that the deposits in this bank, credit are guaranteed by the deposit warranty system, the clients and our citizens are feel safe that they are saving, are protected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Erdur. Mr. Svetlana, please, would you like to close? Thank you, and Svetlana, the very final word will be yours. And by the way, the one for you to repeat the first two dates of increase in the guaranteed amount. So the second reading should happen, then the president should sign the law to make it effective. And the second date is the first of January of 2023. Uh, okay. Your final remarks? Well, um, I've been so excited to be a part of this discussion and I liked it quite a bit. It's not an easy subject to discuss because it entails legislative changes, a change of focus, a change of philosophy, but still I think we have been able to address most, if not all, topical things related to the banking system, banking sector, and even non-banking sector. So 
I'm happy to see that the family of deposit guarantee is growing wider. Oshot Bank is going to join us soon. That means market is evolving. It's not becoming unified. The rules of the game are there. And they're getting better and they are the same for all. And that's so important. For a market, the most important thing is a set of understandable, transparent and absolutely clear rules and outlooks. So once again, I appreciate all of the fellow panelists and uh, thank you so much for your time, for your active participation, speaking your mind, sharing your concerns. And I'd like to thank everybody else watching us online, spending these three hours with us. I hope we're going to see you around again. Thank you so much and thanks to all of you guys. We appreciate your time and business. It's been an exciting discussion, so let's hope that DGF will be able to do what it takes and next time we're going to be able to get together when we have 100,000 as a guaranteed amount. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us this time. I'll see you around. Goodbye.